Mergers at the mill? New concerns over anti-dumping? Where is demand hottest these days? We pose three big questions to product experts from stainless, aluminum, and carbon steel. And we answer viewer questions. Get ready for this special episode of Cup of Joe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special edition of Cup of Joe. I'm Mike Carrazzo, the content manager at Ryerson and Nick Webb. How are you this fine afternoon? Mike, I'm doing excellent. I'm, I'm amazed we're already through uh, through summer at this stage, but it's uh, it's been a good one. Yeah, it's it, it goes all too quick. Um, just drop my kids. Well, didn't drop my kids off at school. They're only in first and third grade. I don't drop them off for a while <laughs> yet, but <laughs> it just went back to school. Summer's back or summer's gone. Um, but um we're still talking about metals and commodities here so uh uh, director of risk management commodities hedging i'd be remiss if i didn't mention your title and uh viewers will notice uh we're joined by a a panel of experts here and we're going to um, we have an exciting show today we're going to um, nick's going to go through his macro update what's going on with manufacturing and the economy in general and then we're going to get into um some things about carbon stainless and aluminum but not only about the products, we, we've uh, we've tasked our, our product managers with three, we think, pretty timely questions about what's going on in the marketplace. Um, those product managers are um, first, at, um, if my uh, orientation is, is correct, directly under Nick would be Brian Crane. He's the product manager of Carbon Flat Roll and Plate. Hello, Brian. Hello, good to be here. And next we have Angie Gomez. She's a product specialist of non-ferrous. Today she'll be uh, talking stainless. Hello, Angie. Hello, all. And last but not least, Jay Springman. Um, You may have recognized him from a recent Red Metals episode we've done. Um, He's our product manager of specialty metals, and we're going to be picking his brain on aluminum today. Hello, Jay. Hi, guys. Good to be back with you. Great. Great. Thanks for coming aboard. So, Nick, um, let's talk. Uh, let's uh, let's go through the disclaimers and hear what's going on with the economy. Sounds great. So with uh, as we always do, got to cover the uh, the legal side of things. These are the opinions of Nick Webb, Mike Carrazzo and our product managers. They are they are not the opinions of of Ryerson as a whole. Um, do your own research. This is not this is not investment advice or anything like that. Let's go ahead and get into it. Got a couple macro slides, and then we'll kick it over to the real stars of the show, um, which I think will be really helpful, not just for you know our own Ryerson colleagues, but also for our customers. As we're sitting here in September, thinking about contract season for 2024, there's a lot to think about, a lot that we've seen over the last couple of years, and uh, and I think they'll give some great insight into things we want to be thinking about as we're as we're structuring contracts and preparing for business conditions for next year. Getting into it, um, we we talked about this very briefly last month, but I, I want to dive back into it because it, it is a continuing theme for now, which is this idea that some economists have deemed the two-speed economy. This notion that we we are already seeing, at least in the case of U.S. and in China, we are seeing this instance where manufacturing PMIs are continuing to tick below 50, which, as many of you may know, is suggestive of year-over-year weakness. On the other hand, however, uh, we're seeing services PMIs, services being consumer spending, travel leisure, hospitality, things like that. Those data points are continuing to show uh, modest growth. Now, it's it's above 50. Um, They are coming a little closer towards 50, but it's growth nonetheless. In the case of the United States, it is important to note that about 80% of the U.S. economy is really centered more around the services side, whether whether we like to admit that in the manufacturing world or not. Um, that is really how the weighting tends to be. So when you've got a heavier weighting and something that's growing, we are still as a whole for the U.S. economy in in growth mode. And we've got a couple slides to to kind of support that. Um, but we do see this this interesting dichotomy of manufacturing data points are cooling off and and continuing to cool off while services economy and the consumer just just won't quit. Um, if we were to compare this to to Europe, and we I know we've talked about this in prior months, Europe is is a bit of a different uh, animal where we're seeing both manufacturing and services PMIs 
moving into fairly deep weakness territory. And, and as we sit here today, uh, Germany is officially in recession as we sit here today. So, um, so Europe is in a bit of a cooler um, or cooler or softer situation than what we're seeing within the U.S. and China. But it is interesting how we're seeing this spread developing between services and manufacturing. We also touched on this slide, and I and I want to highlight it because um, you know we always kick around, and, and certainly people on TV are kicking around. Are we in recession? Are we heading into recession? And everybody's got a different opinion. And when we look at the unemployment rate, it is glaringly in the not recession camp. Um, as we know here at the top of this, this slide, we really don't tend to see recessions until or unless the unemployment rate, the, the U3 unemployment rate, moves up by about 150 basis points. It's at that point in time that we start to see things cool off. With unemployment at 3.5%, we're at very historic lows, and this is going all the way back to the 1940s. So as we sit here today, the the jobs market, the labor market, just really hasn't hasn't cooled off to any extent uh, in, in recent data points. So while we are seeing the unemployment rate at historically low levels, right around three and a half percent, we are seeing some interesting things taking place and some other factors within the jobs market. Uh, this particular chart is showing the JOLTS job opening data, and you can see it's coming off pretty, pretty rapidly. And just in the last couple of weeks, we saw this data point miss expectations to the downside by a fairly hefty margin by about 750,000 people. Um, what's interesting about that is when you think about it from the Fed's perspective, this is probably what they want to see. They want to see the jobs market cooling off. They want to see wages come down because those can be uh, sticky indicators into the CPI. Um, in addition to the JOLTS job opening data, we also saw non-farm payrolls miss expectations. So there are a couple underpinnings taking place within the jobs world that are suggesting that things may be cooling off ever so slightly. Obviously, we're not seeing that within the unemployment rate, but we are seeing that within the JOLTS data and the non-farm payrolls data. So pretty interesting phenomenon going there. It, it is a little perverse that we that we have to talk about um, this potential that that losing jobs is good news, but from the Fed's perspective, that is that is the case for now. Now, very much on the opposite side of things, the GDP tracker, which is tracked by the Atlanta Fed GDP Now Index, it's screaming higher in the last couple couple weeks and months. And and I was actually a bit taken aback by this because it's it's showing some pretty severe growth, uh, all the way up at 5.9 percent, which, as you can see in this chart, going back over the last 12 months, it's much higher than what we've seen over this period of time. And it, it, it's a bit surprising to me because I would say that goes in the face of what many of these other data points that we watch are suggesting, particularly on the manufacturing side, where they're actually showing a little bit of weakness. So I was curious, and I and I hopped on the Atlanta Fed's uh, GDP tracker website to try and get a better idea of what may be driving that. And we haven't shown this this chart in the past, but this is looking at the last several weeks of the indicators and the uh, the compilation of what actually is driving the GDP now index. And what I found pretty, pretty interesting, um, and in this kind of echoes back to the first slide is the consumer just will not quit. Um, so you can see this dark blue line, which is really where a lot of the growth has come from in the last few weeks. That's consumer spending as, as it relates to the PCE index, uh, which coincidentally happens to be one of the Fed's favorite tools to measure what, whether or not the, the economy is cooling or inflation is cooling. It, it continues to, to not just be strong, but actually get stronger in the last several weeks. So whether that's you know the phenomenon of people buying Taylor Swift and Beyonce tickets, I, I don't know for sure exactly where all the money's flowing, uh, but having, tra having, tra having been traveling over the last few weeks, certainly seeing airports still very full, people are traveling for both work and for leisure, and, uh, and a lot of this is, uh, is feeding into much stronger forecasts for now for U.S. GDP. I can, tell you, and it's, I, yeah, I can okay. tell you anecdotally, Nick, just, you know, taking a train every day, it seems a lot more people are doing the public transportation than they have been even in the past few months. And then we talked about this last time, even with, with, with travel, but I think you know, to your point, even for, for business, people are starting to do the public transportation a little bit more as well. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, that being said, and I don't mean to throw a wet blanket on all of this, but when we think about the consumer spending as we and as we sit here and sit in the month of September, it is worth noting that for the first time in about three years, we are beginning to get back into the phase where uh, consumer, or I apologize, student debt uh, is beginning to, to accrue again. 
So for the last two and a half to three years, it was possible for those who took out student loans, it was possible for them to forego those interest payments for, for multiple years. And doing a little bit of quick research, the current total student debt rate or or the amount that's outstanding right now is about $1.6 trillion. Now, that's not to say that all of that has to be repaid in the next couple of months, but but it's going to begin to kick in as we as we get into September and months beyond. And on average, this equates to about $500 per person that has a student loan out. So as we think about this consumer spending uh, idea, there may be $500 that somebody may have may have had earmarked for traveling to Europe or buying those concert tickets that they're going to have to start allocating to student loans and student loan debt interest. Uh, so this is something I think we're, we're going to have to be, keep a very close eye on because there is a chance that as people have to start paying more and more of their income towards student loan uh, debt payments, we may see some of those elements cool off here in the months ahead. But I, th I think that'll be an interesting phenomenon, one that we have not really been dealing with for most individuals who took a loan out over the last couple of years. With that being said, that's what I've got on the macro front. I'm going to kick it over to uh, Mike and the product managers, and I'm sure I'll chime in with a little bit of commodity detail as well. But let's go ahead and get into it. Great, great. Nick, that was the quickest I think I've ever gone through the macro. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> great stuff as always. Um, and li like we said at the beginning, um, there, there's three big questions we want to get to. We think they're very timely. Uh, we're going to get to lead times and pricing and things of that nature. And we actually asked the Cup of Joe audience to send us in some questions because we aren't live. So they they actually sent us in some questions that we'll, we'll get to in the end. But um, and there's three, three, three big things that we wanted to get to. The first one being um, what's going on with U.S. Steel. Um, you know, a lot of news that's been going on in the past month and a half, right? Um, U.S. Steel, US Steel seems poised to be acquired, right? At the latest being this Cleveland Cliffs. Um, that's like a $7.3 billion cash and stock offer. Um, and I, I had to look this up, but, you, you know, U.S. Steel has an annual raw steel making capacity of 22.4 million tons. And uh, I mean, this isn't like a little acquisition we're talking about too, right? U.S. Steel is pretty much uh, been a staple in the U.S. manufacturing for years. So, I mean, what we talked about is like, what does this mean for the larger context, whether it happens or not happen, right? And this, we saw some of this go on in the aluminum space with Apollo and Arconic. So, Brian, why don't you kick us off? What 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 does that mean right now? What's going on? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Great, great way to intro that. This is one of the biggest questions surrounding the carbon steel world right now. What's going to happen with U.S. Steel? So, and the newest development is as of Tuesday, U.S. Steel issued a letter to all of its shareholders and to the public saying that they have entered into several non-disclosure agreements with uh, several several entities to share due diligence information. Normally, this is not something that people publicly announce. So I think this is uh, the U.S. Steel letting the market know that they're continuing down this road and they're going to do whatever's best for their shareholders and their organization. So. The current only publicly known offer that we know of is that Cliffs offer that you mentioned, which is valued at about $35 a share. So, um, yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the big uh, that's the big question hanging over. I mean, it is a it would be a huge ac acquisition and one that continues a trend of consolidation of the industry over the past decade. Uh, from where we had maybe a dozen suppliers to really maybe four or five large suppliers that have really kind of taken over the North American space. Um, Cliffs is the largest steel producer in North America, having acquired most of the uh, assets of uh, uh, what was ArcelorMittal and AK Steel. So they're number one, Nucor's number two, and U.S. Steel is number three. So this would be uh, quite a monumental acquisition if this goes through and uh yeah we're all really kind of watching this space to see what happens next so what Brian, is it? as you talk as you i apologize as you Sorry. talk about the monumental nature of it um you know I, I have to ask the question about potential antitrust or monopoly issues can, can you speak to what what that ultimate company would look like if if cliffs were to acquire uh successfully u.s steel in terms of iron ore assets and maybe automotive steel production 
Yeah, they would become the largest automotive supplier in North America. They would own most of the mining operations in North America. I don't know the exact raw tonnage that they would control, but it would be significant. So I think, yeah, this is going to get a lot of scrutiny, uh, both on the street and with government regulators. Um, but yeah, it, it, it would be it would be a significant amount of uh, automotive supply with one mill group. When the average metal buyer kind of follows this news, well, how does it really affect them? We've talked, Nick, in past couple of Joes, right, with all this consolidation, what does it do for lead time, supply, things like that? I mean, th- this seems like a pretty significant, like I mentioned, over 22 million tons. I mean, what? how does it ultimately impact the end user, the metal buyer, if you will? I, I think that it will impact the average metal buyer. Um, not as much in the beginning as we might think it's going to make this drastic, you know, rock in the pond ripple wave effect. I don't, I think lead times will have to kind of stay where they are now. And um, I just don't know if that if, if we announce on in, in a month that U.S. Steel has been acquired by Cliffs, I don't know that that's going to immediately push lead times out or if it's going to drastically reduce them. I think it's going to take a while for that to get absorbed into the marketplace. I think the bigger question that's that's overhanging the market right now is how will the UAW negotiations with the big three affect something like this Mm. sale? Because as of September 14th, the current labor agreement runs out. And overall, the sentiment among the market is that we will see a strike. We don't know the magnitude. We don't know if it'll be all three. We don't. It could be just one. Uh, People think it would be a short strike, but what short means is kind of being, you know, debated right now. But overall sentiment is that there could be a stri- is that there will be a strike at, at at least one of the production facilities. And that would really impact, like you said, because the uh, Cliffs you said would be a uh, big supplier automotive. US Steel, yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. Cliffs and U.S. Steel are both large, the largest suppliers to automotive in, in North America. Um, if one of those uh, if one of those groups decides to strike at any one of those plants for GM or Stellantis, it, it could lead to some volatility in the market. Um, the last time we saw this was 2019, and we saw we saw some we saw some volatility in prices. They jumbled around for a little bit before the uh, the deal was struck and and uh, the plants were restarted and people came back to work. But uh, yeah, we saw some dips and some increases back in uh, 2019 when this happened the last time. Yeah. So, um- Acquisition wise, merger wise, this is this something just kind of happened when the aluminum space too, right? Uh, Jay, we're talking on the Apollo Arconic front, and uh, maybe speak to how yeah. that relates. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we like you said, like we've we've also seen some movement on that front. One of the the most recent moves, as you suggested, was the acquisition of Arconic by the Apollo Group. You know, that was announced maybe 60, 90 days back, and, and to my understanding, fully closed in the middle part of August. Uh, so from what we're hearing from Arconic, you know, it's it's business as usual. They're in, you know, they're supposed to to operate under the same Arconic name, the same Arconic brand. Uh, it, it's the belief that their business units and and product groups uh, will also stay intact. And I think, you know, they're promoting that that they're going to get some additional leverage with the expertise, you know, the customers. The investment that I think you know Apollo should should bring to the table. So I think from my perspective, on the supply chain side, it it is business as usual. I think we're going to go into you know Q4 negotiating time, and and we're going to interact with Arconic as we've always done, and uh, they're going to come to the table and and hopefully continue to be a valuable supplier for for our company and and many other distributors out there. You know I think the other the other couple of things I wanted to mention, and this really doesn't work along the acquisition side. And maybe not completely new news, but you know something we're watching closely is is Novellus and SDI, which are two companies that have recently broken ground and started the construction of new flat roll facilities in the U.S., uh, specifically down south. So Novellus broke ground on a new rolling facility uh, late last year in Alabama, uh, investment of somewhere in the vicinity of of two and a half billion dollars. Um, you know, that's that's out into the future a bit. I, I think they're supposed to commission that facility sometime in 2025. And 
And similar to Novellus, SDI or Steel Dynamics is, is also taking a, a similar stance. They've invested a couple billion in a new rolling facility in Mississippi. So, you know, they are also planning to be uh, online sometime in, in 2025. I think, I think that's a big deal. I think historically, if you look at aluminum flat roll, we've been under supply. There hasn't been enough supply out there when, when the end use markets and the distribution uh, become really busy. So I think that's, you know, to some degree a welcome a welcome situation to have more capacity, but you know, some we're certainly watching as as the next two years unfold with with that uh, with those two facilities coming on board. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Yep. Angie, how does this affect the stainless front? What's what's going on there? Yeah, so domestically, we do, you know we don't have any any big moves going on currently. Um, kind of like what Jay was saying. So like North American Stainless, one of our you know one of our bigger uh, domestic mills, um, they have some new capacity coming on in you know 2025. So it's still a little far off to to know exactly what that number is going to be and how it's going to impact us. Um, but in the in the short term, um, I think our focus, especially out here on the West Coast where I'm located, is uh, on imports. So we don't have much change going on domestically, but Imports are for sure something that's coming onto our radar. Um, you know, China's slowing down uh, with their consumption of stainless, you know, in particular. Um, so we do know that, you know, producers of stainless along uh, in the Asian market, uh, as long as uh, or as well as globally, um, they're going to start looking for some new outlets uh, for for that material that they're producing since China's not going to be uh, taking it in as, as much as they currently are. So uh, we do expect to see imports increasing uh, going into 2024, um, or at least staying strong uh, at the levels that they currently are. Um, our mills are currently in contract season. I think Nick kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, so mm -hmm. nothing's getting signed right now, but we're definitely starting the, the talks and uh, knowing that that import out there is definitely going to weigh pretty heavily on, on some of these discussions that, that we have going on. Yeah. Hey, Angie, on the back of that, uh, you mentioned imports. Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump the gun and then ask yeah. a question in front of Mike. Um, Obviously, over the last several months, we've talked about the notion that we've seen some cheaper stainless imports coming in from Asia into the United right. States. Uh, more recently, Europe launched, an, launched their own investigation into uh, blocking some of those or, or at least creating a fair you know, playing field for, for stainless imports into Europe. Right. Do you think there's any chance, or I guess in your personal opinion, not not trying to fully put you on the spot, yeah. but in your <laughs> opinion, could that be an early symbol of what we might see playing out in the United States? Would, would the United States be taking measures as well, maybe on the back end of all of that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, we already have the, obviously, uh, anti-dumping, countervailing stuff already in place, 232, um, that we've been grappling uh, for the past couple of years. So yeah, I, I do, ex I would expect probably something similar, um, but uh, along with that, uh, so we, we kind of took it as their following our, our suit, right? We, we kind of put up those walls um, quickly. Um, they're coming around. So you mentioned the, the European market is down. Um, so they're going into protection mode, right? So their mills are hurting, they have capacity. So uh, just like we did, um, their turn is to focus on their own, right? They need to protect, uh, you know, their own Mills and um, so um, the investigation is obviously material that's being produced in Taiwan or China, Taiwan, um, and then they're actually sending it uh, to like Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, Turkey, um, having some little work done, and then trying to get it in that way. So circumvention is kind of the fancy word for that. Um, yeah. So uh, by them putting this uh, in place and starting this investigation, it's it's really looking at at drying up that import supply chain. Um, so that way it, it really turns the demand uh, to focus on the European producers and to help them out. Um, kind of along with that, it's kind of segueing a little bit, but they did add um, a couple of raw metals to their like critical list, um, which is also gonna help some of their smelting and um, some of their production, uh, you know, on the on the raw goods side. Um, you know, we know energy is an issue over there. So, um, all that's going to help them get some more funding. So they, they really are putting some things in place uh, to, to stimulate the European market. So um, I think no doubt we're going to see some of that trickle into into the U.S. market. Um, it's just still a little too early to see how they roll it out and how effective it is. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's actually our, our second question about the end. I bring <laughs> concerns. Oh, it's a great lead and I think it's it's good. And then I guess to that, that's not only affecting the stainless market, right? I mean, um, Brian, 
some steel tariffs in Mexico. Um, Jay, there's long been um, anti-dumping, countervailing in, in the aluminum fronts, I guess. Um, kick it over to you, Brian. What What's to be known about or what what's what's the big news about the steel tariffs in Mexico? Yeah, so Mexico raised their rates uh, from 15% to 25%. Uh, sentiment around the market is that they did that to, to come on par with the U.S. So like what we did with Section 232 a few years ago. Now, this does have some exclusions. So members of the CPTPP, uh, so large metal producing countries like Japan, Malaysia, Australia, they do not fall under this new tariff. So if you do have a free trade agreement with Mexico, you pretty much are excluded from this. Uh, but a lot of a lot of countries that ship a lot of metal into Mexico are now going to be subject to this new 25% tariff, and that includes country, uh, a big producer of metal like Korea. So that that that's affecting the Korean supply. But again, there are some uh, there are some free trade agreement uh, exceptions, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be interesting to see how it plays out over the uh, over the balance of this year and into 24. What is that again? CPPT? What? Yeah, it's the uh, it's the <laughs> Comprehensive Partnership for Trans Pacific. Uh oh, whoops. Trans Rolls off Pacific. The <laughs> yeah, comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans Pacific Partnership. Yeah, that's Oof. it. That's it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Say it five times fast. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and then, it, of course, Jay. You know, as I mentioned, this has been going on for a while with aluminum. Anything, anything new, noteworthy to talk about on that front when it comes to aluminum? Yeah, no, I think you hit on the head. It's it's been in play for a while, as Angie and, and Brian both mentioned. Uh, 232 is still out there um, in, in the, uh, from the countervailing and, and anti-dumping uh, structure. Really, no major changes as of late. It's still extremely restrictive to try and buy out of you know China, certain parts of Asia. Um, you know, a year or so back, I, I think we did take a handful of countries, mainly European countries, and we transitioned them more into a what they call a TRQ system, which is more of a quota-based system. And we're tracking and allowing a certain amount of, of aluminum volume to, to enter into the U.S. You know, without a tariff. Uh, but once they reach a certain threshold, depending on country, that's when the tariffs uh, would kick in. Um, so really, you know, my, my expectation on the aluminum side moving forward is, is this is going to remain in play. As, as Angie had mentioned, you know, the U.S. Is, has positioned themselves, to, you know, to protect, you know, what, what we have here in the U.S. to be able to promote manufacturing and, and grow manufacturing here domestically. So, I, again, I don't see that changing, you know, back half of this year or, or even into next year as we, we come into a new administration as well. Makes sense. Jay, let's stick with you as we kick off the third question. Sure. And, and it really relates to a lot of the uh, what we got from the audience, everyone wants to know, you know, where are the hot pockets of, of demand coming from, what are the, where's, where are the biggest concerns going to, going to be at. So um, as you look into the balance of 2023 and maybe even beyond for aluminum, where are you going to, where do you see demand being hottest right now? Sure. Yeah, good question. And I, I think in general, if we look at it today, right, it's, it's a bit soft as a whole. And, and I think the general consensus from what I hear is, is the back half may remain that way, you know, trend trend soft to flat. Um, you know, with that, we've seen metal values also slide down with with LME and, and the Midwest side of things. But I but I do think there is some some bright lights or some some hot pockets out there that that are being talked about that we're seeing more uh, more often. One one of those is aerospace. You know, I continue to hear and, and see some increased demand expectations, really with products tied into that market. So I think when you when you look at aerospace, you think of cold finish, you think of hard alloy, you think of grades like 2000, 7000 series plate. And, you know, honestly, 2023, those those type of products have been a bit tight already. And and we've talked to our you know our major partners, the people like Kaiser and Constellium, and, and they really see and are starting to promote that 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 demand in aerospace is only going to grow larger as we work through 2024 and even into 2025. So. You know, another thing we recently saw as it relates to two and seven plate is is recent price increases. So there was a, another 20 to 30 cents a pound put into the market, accepted into the market, you know, even well ahead of, of the negotiation period that's that's upcoming into the fourth quarter. So, you know, they're really standing behind the fact that they think that's going to grow. And I think that could drive certainly some tightness into that that two and seven plate market. 
Uh, another one I'd mention, hmm. you know, is semiconductor. You know, we continue to see a lot of investment into new manufacturing facilities here domestically. You know, you've got companies like LAM and Apply, these people that are building, you know, machines and equipment that manufacture semiconductors. And, and we're hearing from those folks that, you know, their demand is increasing. And, and ultimately that, that in use market takes a lot of heat treated plate products. So you look at like 6061 T6 plate, you know, the, the thought now is that that's only gonna grow larger in the demand side as we get into 2024. And again, creating what could be a dynamic of, you know, of short supply, if you look at, <clears throat> at heat treated plate, you know, well into next year. So something that we're, we're watching closely and, and plan to keep a pulse on as, as things move forward this year. Very interesting. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Angie, how about on the stainless front? It's all refrigerators and EV, right? Yeah, for, you know, pretty much. No. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, 304 is always going to be kind of our gold standard. That's our, you know, bread and butter all day long. Um, but this year we've actually seen a pretty steady demand for uh, 316, um, which isn't uh, very available offshore. You know, we don't get a lot of offers or or imports coming in on 316. So when we see that demand, um, it's a good sign for us, right? Uh, we like to see some stuff that we we really rely heavily on on domestic uh, producers for. Um, it just it gives us a good benchmark that you know we, we still have some demand for some domestic stuff. We're not having to search for a lot of uh, global market um, items. Um, you know, we're coming into election year, so that's going to affect a lot of stuff. We don't know if things are going to come into play, go out of play. Um, like you said, EV is going to stay strong. Um, so you might not always think about stainless steel and, and EV going hand in hand, but um, it's more on the backside, on the raw goods. So it's on the nickel, right? So nickel's going to going to be something that that we watch on the stainless side um, because they're going to start using more of it uh, on, on the EV side. So depending on how... Nickel comes onto the market, uh, and you know it's, it's availability and all that good stuff. Um, it, it could start playing a factor in in stainless production uh, globally. So um, Indonesian mines are turning more to to produce more nickel. So hopefully it's going to balance out. That's kind of what we're seeing right now. Um, but yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to say that there's one front runner at the moment. Um, but yeah, automotive EV staying strong and that's across stainless and aluminum. Uh, our truck trailer seems pretty busy. Um, but as far as going into next year, I think we can't count out medical equipment. Um, we've mm -hmm. seen a little bit of growth in them this year. So, um, but yeah, a little, little too early for us to, to put a, a bet on a horse uh, right now. Well, Angie, just this morning, I saw, I saw a picture of a, of an auto truck carrying about four or five cyber trucks on the back of it um, yes. and, and the, the exterior of those is fully stainless steel so the the merging between stainless steel and evs is getting greater and greater it is yeah we went to uh we were down in long beach a few months back at an ev show and uh some of the stuff they're rolling out is, is really cool uh you know there's it's obviously kind of crazy to think this is where the world's going but but exciting at the same time so yeah it's, it's interesting to see how the, all the worlds start to play together when uh new technology is rolled out you mentioned 316. What what is that used a lot for? You know, 316 we use that a lot. Marine, uh, you know, good corrosion resistance, that kind of stuff. So out here on the west, we see a lot of it uh, in agriculture. Uh, you know, repairing some stuff. Uh, we have the ocean right here next to us, so um, a lot of uh, outdoor structures, stuff like that. Uh, typically, they're gonna throw some 316 at it. So it's just it's a it's it's a good mark. It, it crosses a lot of different. Um, sectors so that's why when we see demand being up it's it's kind of it speaks good to us overall that um that they are turning to other grades um so that way we know we have kind of a good blend going into the, the future year and we can kind of get those order books in line and ready for it you know on that nick is there anything new on the nickel front going on i know you talked last about a new producer coming on to the uh the london metal exchange or just in general nickel's kind of had that volatile ride based on what angie's saying how what's the latest on nickel well, we have we have one more fraud incident in the last 30 days, unfortunately. Um, so it, it's it's alleged or or the rumor is that it, it's it's still tied back to this Indian producer who is fraudulently sending rocks around instead of nickel. Um, this one, in fact, it was much lower. It was it was a much smaller value, but it was about three million dollars. A uh, a St. Louis trading company called Cataman Metals. They they apparently purchased it from this Indian producer, and it turned out they opened it up, and it was. A bag of rocks again. So it wasn't the five or six hundred million dollar type fraud that we had we had seen a couple months ago with Traffic Europe, but but it's still happening. So 
it's fraught, fraught with its issues. But in terms of the the actual nickel market and and the London Metal Exchange, no no real material updates. It's it's much of the same uh, versus what we would have talked about last month. But the expectation is still that a lot of new class one is going to be coming to market over the next, let's say, 15 to 18 months. Yes. Huh. Nice. Brian, how about on the steel front? Where do you see hot hot areas? Yeah, hot areas, definitely infrastructure based uh, sectors, um, offshore wind, uh, transmission towers, uh, the heavy machinery that goes into putting up all that stuff. I mean, those those uh, bridge and highway work, especially. So we've seen plate stay kind of in that elevated state. Order books at plate mills are very strong. A lot of that is driven by that infrastructure work, especially. So uh, those are that's 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 the hot market in in plate. Um, you know, on the flat roll side, it's it's a little bit of of you know data center work is still good. Server racks are still good. I would say that HVAC is good. It's not great. It's not bad. It's just okay. So I think that's kind of holding its own. But I think in the sheet market, we're all really holding out to figure out when the bottom of the uh, uh, of the pricing is going to hit. It kind of feels like it could happen soon. I feel like you know we're close to an inflection point. You know there are the September scrap trade is, has kind of kicked off, but we're still a couple of weeks from that number getting printed. So you know early rumors are that we could could see an increase in scrap and you know i'm kind of hoping that that does that does play out like that so um yeah that's 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 where carbon stands right now and, and brian just to piggyback off of that i'm, I'm going to touch really quickly on the on the auto or the potential auto workers strike as it relates to steel on, on one hand you you certainly have the the aspect that if the auto workers do go on strike they are the automotive industry is the biggest buyer of carbon sheet that would impact the demand side of the equation at least for a period of time What's what's interesting is on the flip side, the bullish factor that it would have is auto also is the biggest generator of of scrap. And so what you actually would get if if the auto workers go on strike, you get a decreased production of scrap, which Mm -hmm. which weirdly enough could actually prop up scrap prices for a period of time. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't say the the knee jerk reaction is to, you know, sell everything and short steel um, because it couldn't it could, in fact, be held up by just the sheer fact that. Uh, scrap prices would be held up due to just decreased supply. Yeah, great point. Great point. Um, no, this is this is very good, and I'm glad we were able to do this. Um, tap tap into some really uh, timely topics. But as as we said, we did get a few questions from the audience. I was hoping um, you all can stick around and maybe just answer a few of these. Uh, most of them went around like, you know, what are you seeing in in pricing? And we we touched on a lot of those. But but what one that really stood out to me is, um, are you more excited about the impact in your space from private spending or government spending? And and maybe that speaks to, you know, investment infrastructure things of that nature. But um, I guess let's kick it. Uh, Throw it out to uh, out to the group. Who wants to take that one? I'll jump on it. I, I'll take some spending from any direction right now. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna say no to pretty much any business that's gonna come our way. Uh, I think you know government spending is obviously gonna speak more to infrastructure, transportation, that kind of a thing. Um, and then I think private spending uh, for me is more exciting. Um, just we know that that's more project based. Uh, that's kind of some one off, some cool stuff happening. Um, so for me, I, I get more excited about private. But at this point, uh, where the market is. I'll, I'll take it from anywhere. Good point. I think Andrew nailed that one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All money's good money. That's a great answer. Yeah. Um, besides all the indexes Nick talks about here on Cup of Joe, are there any tangential in tangential? That's a hard word to say for me. <laughs> indexes you watch that highly correlate to your space. I mean, what what as the product managers, what do you, what are you all watching? terms of indexes and what what's uh, driving your your markets. Jay, yeah, here from, let's go to yeah, you. From my, yeah, from my side, and, and Nick obviously touches upon just about every one that, that I would look at, but but certainly the LME and how that's trending and, and traded, you know, each and every day, right? There's a there's a close to that and a trend to that each week. You know, we're watching that, you know, when it comes out in the morning and, and what it closes at each evening and then we're watching the trend obviously month over month, year over year. And, and that that really drives a lot of, of kind of our 
our internal costing structures with with our mill partners on the aluminum side. So we have to have a good pulse of that, and and we'll continue to use that as a as a gauge to to what what's happening in the market. Obviously, you know you've got the Midwest premium that's applied to that to to create the the Midwest transaction price, which which is what we buy off domestically. So I think that's probably the largest from from my perspective that we deal with and, and we'll continue to watch closely. Thanks, guys. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I, I, I pay attention to a lot of the different CRU prints from around the around the globe. I, I'm I'm the West Coast based product manager, so I deal with a lot of global supply myself. Um, I keep an eye on the European CRU and Shanghai hot roll and even Shanghai rebar is a decent indicator of how their construction market works. So now, although we can't bring Chinese metal into the United States, it's still a good indicator of what's happening in Asia. Um, there's some muddiness in that number, but it's it's still something that that I pay attention to. And anything coming out of the CCTTPP, whatever you want. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Free trade agreements all around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, great stuff. Uh, don't want to keep you all too much longer. Um, this is the time of the show when I ask for a closing thought. Um, what's uh, what's keeping you up at night? What's uh, what are you most excited about? Um, and uh, Nick, let's go to you. Oh, man. What keeps the risk manager up at night? Unfortunately, when you're a risk manager, everything looks like a risk. So, <laughs> so a lot of things can keep me up at night. Um, but no, I mean, short answer. I, I, we touched on some of these factors. We're, we're certainly looking like we are in restrictive territory from an interest rate standpoint. And and usually, not always, but usually when the Fed is trying to cool off the economy, the unfortunate thing is a lot of times they are successful at it. And I think we're seeing early stages of that. I think my personal opinion is we probably continue to see a few more months at least of, of a continuation of that theme, which is just higher lending standards, um, you know, more restrictive policy. There is a there is a concerted effort to cool off conditions, cool off inflation, and part of that's you know cooling off business conditions. So, you know, that broadly is what what keeps me up at night. Th this too shall pass. I don't anticipate a a 2008 2000 you know 20 type recessionary condition. But do I think things are going to be a little more difficult in the months ahead? Than, than where we were, you know, in the last 12. Yeah, probably for, for a little bit, um, but certainly not sky is falling. And, and, and as everybody mentioned already, there are still pockets of strength in certain end markets. It's not every end market, but there are pockets of strength still out there. So I don't want to belittle that fact as well. Angie, how about you? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm I'm hopeful for some some stability going into 2024 uh, as far as pricing goes uh, for me keeping up at night is, is watching that nickel market seeing what's going to happen as far as material coming online uh, the, the extra demand coming on from EV how that's all going to kind of play together um, you know I, I, I like to keep it kind of a pulse on uh, mill capacity you know the, the better they're doing obviously the the, the better it's speaks for the, the the general market um so those are some of the stuff that we try to keep an eye on uh it's just kind of what's going on in the global market as well as what's going on in our own backyard so um yeah it'd be interesting to see as we go into 2024 how, how it all kind of stabilizes out good stuff how about you jay yeah and no, i'm gonna i'm gonna jump on that optimistic bandwagon obviously i'm hoping for for brighter days ahead from a, an economy standpoint you know, I, I think I'm going to triple down on on this auto situation too. You guys talked a lot about the carbon side of it. Don't forget, there's there's certainly a lot of aluminum that goes into uh, to the manufacturing of cars these days. And and as we get into the fourth quarter, and as these contract negotiations start, and you know, the if that strike is something that that truly you know comes to fruition and lasts a long time, I mean, that could certainly be disruptive to these contract periods where you know, people have started initial offers into the market and now all of a sudden they've got to find a way to fill capacity, right? So things change or could change very quickly, you know, the longer that auto situation lingers. So I think that's that's in the forefront of my mind right now. Fair point. Fair yep. point. Mr. Crane, bring us home. Yeah, that's it. You know, the steel guy stays up at night thinking about the auto workers. I mean, that that <laughs> that's going to be a, that, that's going to be a big deal for the balance of the year. It's um, it, 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 look, not to not to make a bad joke, but automotive drives the steel industry. So, if if uh, if we have shutdowns at one or three plants or two plants, it's it's going to cause it's going to cause some, some 
and stuff. So uh, that's what keeps me up at night. But, you know, the positivity of it all is we're going to get through it and things look good. We do see some pockets of stability. And I think we're going to see those pockets of stability leak into other things as, as we as we continue to get through some of these backlogs. You know, as I visit customers and I speak with customers, there are a lot of places that have large backlogs into the middle of next year, even further. So there are some definite uh, silver linings to the uh, uh, to the class that we see. That's great. Well, thank you all. Um, great stuff. Um, and uh, for those, as we mentioned at the top, you know, contract season or just metal, metal in general, um, check out Ryerson.com. Uh, we do Cup of Joe first Thursday of every month um, live. Uh, answer your questions. Um, please, please register. And uh, thanks for joining us today.